Good afternoon, everyone. Many thanks for you joining uh, the IMEKI for Powerful Steps to Improve Your Coaching and Mentoring Skills webinar this afternoon. Um, for those who haven't heard the last couple of messages I, I uh, announced, please, um, if you haven't already, um, access the chat box. You can do this by clicking that little tab that's on the side of the screen, on the right hand side of the screen. There should be a little a little tab with an arrow on it that uh, clicks out and you can then click on the chat box. Please use the chat box to ask any questions, introduce yourself. Um, if you have any problems, please articulate them in the chat box. Um, my name is Rob Austin Goodall. I'll be moderating this and, and, and keeping control and looking after what's in the chat box. Um, but as we're at 12.30, I'll hand over to my colleague, Alison Roberts, to start off the webinar. Hi, Rob. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much. So I've just been looking at the chat box and um, hi to Pete from Houston. We've got Murdad in Tehran. Um, welcome to everybody, James and the Cotswolds. I do not take your, your time commitment lightly. So I am going to try in the next three quarters of an hour or so to deliver as much value as I can. Please do feel free to pop where you're from in the chat box and ask any questions as we go along. My colleague Rob will be keeping an eye, as he mentioned, on the chat box and I will be taking questions at the end. So let's get started. So this is what we're going to be covering today. I'm going to talk you through four really key steps to help you develop and implement coaching and mentoring within your teams, your organisation and also for yourself. So what we're going to do is cover those four areas. And the reason that this is so topical is that over the last 10 years, and I've really seen this with a lot of the um, customers that we work with on a day to day basis, that both coaching and mentoring have really accelerated and grown in popularity over the last 10 years and especially over the last three when more and more managers are taking a coaching approach to leadership. So some of the key topics that we're going to be discussing today and these are the outcomes that you can expect are we're going to be talking through the difference between coaching and mentoring. As I mentioned, I'm going to take you through four powerful steps to enhance your own abilities. And we're going to be talking through why listening and staying curious are so important, particularly within a mentoring and coaching relationship. And then we're going to touch at the end on how to begin to establish a coaching and mentoring culture and practice in your workplace if this is not something that you are currently doing. Now, in a moment, I will be asking you to put some answers in, a, in the chat box. So just so you can see, this is these are kind of the four key stages we're going to be going through this afternoon. I'm going to be talking you through a leveraged approach to coaching and mentoring. We're going to be talking through self-coaching the importance of rapport and relationships. And then, as I mentioned, we'll be touching on culture at the end. So this is me um, with pre-lockdown hair, as you'll see at the end. Um, I head up the leadership, coaching, management, project management, and commercial side of learning and development at the IMECI. And this is just a little bit of my background. So I've got over 20 years in learning and development, both as a facilitator um, and working in key positions in L&D. And prior to that, my background was as a business owner. And I have a lot of experience in both sales and marketing as well. So I'm able to approach L&D with a strong commercial focus. So let's talk about the first point, which is leveraging your approach. So what is the difference between coaching and mentoring? Please pop your answers in the chat box. So the difference between coaching and mentoring. And as you're doing that, I'm going to continue talking. And as I said, my colleague Rob and I will be keeping an um an eye on the chat box. So just pop your answers. What is the difference between coaching and mentoring? So what is coaching 
and what is mentoring? Okay, so let's see some of those answers coming through. Hopefully they'll begin to come through in just a second. I know there's always a very, very slight time delay. Thank you, Beverly. So mentoring can give advice and coaching is best not to give advice. Absolutely spot on. Yeah. Steve says coaching is about improving performance, but mentoring is wider. Absolutely. And includes pastoral care. Yeah, that's a great point. Roger says coaching um, is, let me just have a look here. Sorry, you're <laughs> okay. Coaching is training, Roger Lewis. Mentoring is motivating. Yeah, absolutely great. So, really good to see some of these come through. So, I what I try to do is just keep the definitions really, really concise. And I put training on there, and I'll tell you why in a second. So, workplace coaching or employee coaching is the continuous two way feedback between the employee and the coach. Paul, absolutely great. Yeah, coaching is teaching, mentoring is helping side by side on the job. So the goal with coaching is to work on areas for improvement and reinforce strengths in order to maintain the coach's progress and improve their performance. So with coaching, you tend to have a singular or specific aim in mind. Whereas mentoring is more of a reciprocal relationship, although coaching should be too. You should both be learning from each other. But mentoring is more of an at-will relationship, which can and often occurs between a more senior and a less senior employee for the purpose of the mentee's growth, learning and career development. So I'm a qualified coach and um, for the last 30 years, I've been a qualified enterprise mentor. And what I found is that with mentoring, it tends to be a more open ended and directed relationship. So I've had instances where I've worked with mentees and we, we've covered a certain area. I've perhaps opened up my network for them. Um, and supported them in different areas that we've pressed pause whilst they've gone off to implement. And then they sometimes come back with a different but related issue, sometimes up to two or three years down the line. Whereas coaching addresses really, really specific issues set against measurable goals, as we'll see in a moment. So I've put training and development on there because it kind of crosses over a little bit with both of the other two. It refers to activities within a company created to enhance the knowledge and skills of employees, whilst at the same time providing information and instruction on how to perform tasks better. Now, that's not to say as a coach and mentor, you won't be doing either of those two things. So it's quite an interesting triad when we look at these, and there are some very, very subtle differences. So this is a definition that I absolutely loved with coaching. Um, the reason that I love it is because it has the word collaborative in there. And I also like a systematic process because my dad was a scientist, although I'm not an engineer. I was raised to think in terms of systems and data. And coaching has to um, work with a system because that way we know when progress is being made and goals have been reached and potentially the next goals then need to be quantified. So I thought this was a really, really good definition. So I'm going to put a poll up now. Rob's going to put a poll up. And I would love if you could all take part. So you can choose more than one answer. Okay, hopefully you are now picking up the sound and you can see the poll that Rob has just dropped yeah, in. I've, I've released it. Great, it's yeah, we, that's come up. Thanks, Rob. So please do choose more than one answer there. Okay. 
And just as you're doing that, I just wanted to make the point that in the last three years, as I said at the beginning, we've seen a real upsurge in organisations who are not just coaching um, on a day-to-day -day basis, but they're also coaching around feedback um, in order to feed into appraisals. Um, and also setting up internal and group coaching programs. So I'm seeing a coaching approach or intervention with more and more engineering leaders and they are looking to perfect their coaching skills. So this is something that we get asked for more and more. And if you didn't know, was, was Rob's just collecting the data there? We Alison, do you, want to, do you want me to stop the poll now? Yeah, that'd be great actually, thank you. So we also do offer one-to-one -one and group coaching at the IMECI. Um, so let's just get the answer. Um, you know, some of the some of the data from that poll, Rob, when you get a second. And whilst he's doing that, I just want to take you through or just put up on the screen here the benefits of coaching and mentoring. So we're going to focus on employer a little bit more at the end, but for the employee, the benefits are really, really clear. Alison, um, you, should, you should better see the published results. Okay, can't see them yet. Okay, they haven't come through on my screen yet. Uh, oh, yeah. pretty, okay. Pre, pre, pretty much. Yeah. It's an even split of 25% each. Oh, really? <laughs> 27.64 uh, coach uh, who have coached someone, 22.5. Uh, sorry, 22.6 uh, 22 who have been mentored. Um, it's based, basically 25% throughout the, throughout the uh Brilliant. Yeah. Brilliant. Thank you. OK, so I'm just going to touch on a couple of these just uh, for the sake of time. So um, hopefully you should be able to see um, on my screen the benefits of coaching. and mentoring. <coughs> Great. So. In terms of self-development, coaching and mentoring will not only help you and your teams to collect and learn more within the organisation, but it collectively allows them to grow. So growth is a really huge benefit and outcome of both coaching and mentoring. And although each approaches it slightly differently with coaching, it's very much about the coachy being supported by you, the coach, to find the answers within them. Whereas with mentoring, you are guided to find those answers and, and pointed in the right direction. So both, as I said, very slightly different interventions there. Absolutely no doubt um, that with coaching and mentoring, employees feel more included, and their perception of themselves in the workplace changes. They start to feel more valued and appreciated. And for anyone who's had coaching and mentoring, no doubt you would have felt the same way. And one of the, the interesting things um, on there is uh, once an employee has been coached or mentored, they've got that skill for life. They can transfer it into their personal lives. And they also then, once they've experienced it, are much better positioned to support others as a coach. So to be a coach or mentor themselves. So let's talk about the first powerful step, which is leverage. So why is this important? That slide will come up in just a second. There we go. So Leveraging means two things. It means leveraging your strengths so that you coach from a position of personal power and confidence. But leverage also means making sure that you know and understand the various different approaches that you can take so that your coaching conversations are matched to the person, the situation, and the behaviour or outcome that they're looking for. So leveraging is really important from those two different perspectives. You're leveraging your own strengths and you are adopting and um, 
changing your approach depending on the person and the scenario. So having that ability to customise your coaching discussions will absolutely deliver better results, no question. Um, and that is something that we are going to look into now. So I'm not going to cover all of these coaching styles with you. We do do it on the coaching and mentoring workshop. And by the way, you can also um, enroll on a CMI based um, version of coaching and mentoring now. But I am going to touch on a couple of these because they are quite interesting. So in the chat box, has anyone seen these different leveraged approaches before? And do you use them? So just pop your answers in the chat box. Um, so I'm going to talk about some of these different approaches. The autocratic coaching approach is not something that I would use very often. Um, we have talked about how coaching is less directive than mentoring. Oh, that's great, Lionel. I've just seen your answer there. Brilliant. Um, OK, so autocratic coaching tends to keep the coach in control at all times. We're striving for perfection through excellence. Now, perfection doesn't exist in the world because we're humans. And as humans, we are necessarily imperfect. Um, but what happens with autocratic coaching is that the coach really, really does take charge. Now, because this is quite rigid, it can feel a little bit overbearing to some employees who are used to a more hands off approach. But for people who are new to coaching, you may find that on the first session, this more guided approach works better because it gives your new coachee a clear track to run on. So it can be very, very powerful. So <clears throat> holistic coaching, this is probably the most common style of coaching that leaders use. And this is something that we discuss in a lot of our classes because it is so powerful. So it uses the belief that everything is connected. And what happens is that you tend to have this underlying um, uh, energy, I guess, where both parties are fully engaged in mutual growth um, and mutual benefit. So it's very much that collaborative approach that we saw on the definition earlier. Um, what it does is it gives employees a strong sense of inclusion and you can use holistic coaching on a team basis as well as one to one. Um, that sense of inclusion is really powerful when you combine it with delivering a vision because it can help your team member get a much stronger perspective on where they are in the organisation. So their position, where they come from, where they're going and how to best close the gaps. So the slides will be available to you on the LMS. As I said, I haven't got time to go through all of these today, but I did, in terms of leverage, just want to cover one more thing with you. And that is um, a, a different look at coaching approaches. It can be more or less formal, and it can take place between individuals or groups will be a fluid um, expression of all of these. So that makes coaching a very, very flexible approach to personal and professional development. It lends itself really, really well. So I just want to touch on one thing um, in terms of coaching approaches. Please do always ensure that at whatever style coaching and whether it is more or less fluid, that you use a contract. Now, a contract can be very informal. It can be um, a simple agreement between both parties. It must always tick the box so that the coachee knows it's confidential. But what a contract does is it provides you with goals for the relationship, boundaries, 
it gives the coachee a sense of what to expect, and what not to expect, and how the coach and coachee or mentor and mentee will interact and work together. So these are absolutely critical. Um, so please do not forget to have some kind of contract in place when you begin the coaching process. And it should actually ideally um, apply at sort of two different levels, if you like. It should be in terms of procedure and professional. So procedure is things like you know, when, where and how often we're going to meet, how long each session is going to be. And professional is things like what the coach and coachee want to achieve in terms of the subject and desired outcomes, which subjects are off limits, roles and responsibilities. So again, any questions, please do feel free to pop those in the chat box for me. Um, and Rob and I will cover those at the end. Great to hear, John. So John says probably uses more of a holistic approach. And that, as I said, is really what we're talking to a lot of leadership these days um, is around that approach and perfecting it, actually. Um, so you should see something there on team coaching. And I've just highlighted um, that study that I picked up there where it shows that organisations with coached teams have a culture that is 36% more collaborative. You know, I just, when I read that, it was just, it, it really is very powerful. 32% lower staff turnover and 18% more likely to, to show an improved bottom line. Again, these are really strong figures. And this is a recent piece of research that, again, is available to you on the LMS. So we can see that coaching can foster a culture of continuous learning. It can help break down silos between different parts of the organisation, increase team functionality and maturity by helping teams to involve a lot faster than they would have done on their own. So let's look at self-coaching. So we've got another poll here, which Rob is going to pop up for you. And again, please, please do pop your answers in um, that poll. It's really, really great for us to get these because they it helps to inform um, our content, not just in terms of webinars, but actually we, we've been updating a lot of our most popular course material and coaching and mentoring is part of that. So everything that you feed into the polls today, I will personally be building in to our material to ensure that it is absolutely targeted around your needs. Okay, so hopefully that poll has now come up. Rob, um, I'm gonna just get you to keep that up for another second or two. Just, just let me know when you want me to shut it off. All right, brilliant. Okay, we'll just leave it for a second. Um, OK, so if you wouldn't mind just shutting that off now um, and just let's get a sense of the numbers on there. Great. Oh, that's really brilliant. So 29 percent who practice self-reflection. That is such great news for me. Um, and likewise, thirty over just over 30 percent who self-coach and reflect. These are very, very different figures to what I saw two years ago. So the, these are really great to see. Thank you so much for that. So I'm going to give you something that I use. This is my own self-coaching and self-reflective practice. I've been doing this for 35 years now, and it has never failed me. And in fact, I will do it after today's session. I always take two or three minutes, um, and you can do this in 30 seconds, to go over what went well, what didn't go so well, what I'm gonna keep doing forward, what uh, keep going forward, what I'm gonna change, and what I'm gonna stop. 
So when I first joined IMECI, um, my manager asked us to adopt this particular strategy um, in our one-to-ones. It's stop, start, continue and change. So please do pop a yes in the chat box if you've heard of this before and if you use it. So it's a very easy one to remember. It's great to use alongside coaching practice, whether you're using it in your own self-reflection, but also when you are coaching others. I always ask for permission if I'm asking for feedback for myself or if I'm going to give feedback or I'd like to give feedback to somebody else. Always ask for permission. And just a tip for you, don't ever feedback more than one piece of information at a time. Because it will feel to your coachee, especially if it's something that you want them to, to address, to change or improve. Obviously not if it's positive feedback. Um, and also, by the way, try and avoid a feedback sandwich. It's just, it is absolutely toe curling um, because people know that they're going to get um, positive, negative, positive. And so people are primed for that and it, it just doesn't work. Um, but yeah, if you are giving feedback where you're asking someone to address a certain behavior um, or to make some changes, only give feedback on one area at a time because it can feel like they've had the rug pulled out from underneath them otherwise. So give feedback on one area, work with them to, to um, adjust that behavior. Um, and then once that has done and you've both agreed that it's been completed and the results have been observed and measured, then go on to the second piece of feedback. So how do you ask for permission? That's such a great question. So I just I literally just say, look, um, it be, I've been watching your your work over the last week. On the whole, it's been great. There's been a couple of things that I just want to discuss with you. Tell me when would be a good time for us to go through this? Um, so I know that I'm saying yes, but and people always say you shouldn't do that. But actually, when you're talking on the spot, that's the most natural piece of language that you're, you're going to use. It's quite difficult to remember not to say but. Um, and so it just generally pops out of my mouth. So that would be that would be the kind of thing that I would say. Um, and we're all adults and so I just generally tend to think that it's not going to matter too much to people. Just um, a quick thing for you. Um, I don't know if any of you have heard of Erin Meyer. So she wrote The Culture Map and she recently um, wrote a new book called No Rules Rules um, and it was all about the culture at Netflix. Highly recommend that you, yes, Matthew, thank you. Um, highly recommend that you take a look at the book. Now, the reason that I'm bringing it up is in relation to feedback. So they have a culture of continuous improvement at Netflix, and that's part of the reason they're so successful. So one of the things that Erin Meyer did in as part of the research around this book is she looked into why they were so successful at receiving feedback and making instant change. And what they did is, and what they do is that once a month, they all go out for dinner and they give each other feedback. So they do this in teams. Now, everyone has said when they first started, the first two or three times was so uncomfortable. But after the first two or three times, because they realized that everybody was feeling equally uncomfortable, everyone was feeling equally exposed, actually it became a lot easier. And what they did is they shared feedback with each other and made each other accountable. And that whole culture of instant feedback and incremental change has underpinned some of the incredible results that they have seen and will continue to see at Netflix. Yeah, Peter, great comment. I think it's extremely important to give feedback on positive aspects of the coach's behaviour. Otherwise, coaching could be seen as a negative interaction. Absolutely, 100%. It serves to reinforce the good. No question. Absolutely no question. 
Um, and in fact, um, coach a coaching conversation is looking for these observable um, results, these observable successes and feeding them back to people. Um, you know, that is at the core of what coaching is. And then I tend to wait for someone to come back to me to then begin um, coaching around challenges. Because if you do that, what Peter's mentioning there in the chat, what that does, it creates trust. And so people will come to you and say, I feel like I've been doing really well, but there's this one area that I've been really struggling with. And at the core of coaching, that is what you want. It's for people to come to you rather than for you to be continually prompting the coaching conversation. So in terms of your own reflective practice, stop, start, continue, change is probably the most powerful um, set of four words that you can use. So what should I do more or less of and why? What can I do differently next time? And then when I've asked myself these questions, I take one action that I'm going to implement going forward. And as I said, I've been doing this for around 35 years now. It really, really works. So in the chat box, what are the two foundational skills of building rapport and sustaining strong trust-based relationships? Pop whichever two skills you think that is in the chat box. Okay, the two skills that are absolutely critical for building rapport and strong trust-based relationships. Pop your answers in the chat box. I'm just gonna wait for those to come through. I'm just waiting to see um, what, yes, great, Jean, thank you. Great, Ian, yeah, confidentiality and trust, real listening and empathy, I love that. Honesty and respect, honesty and listening, brilliant. Thank you, Stuart, listening and honesty again. Amir says honesty, absolutely, empathy. And there's a really fascinating article, actually, that's just come out by Forbes on empathy and how it's a key leadership trait. So if you look that up, that has literally um, just come out and it's brilliant. So lovely Brett says communication and empathy. Thank you so much. So um, I'm going to go with listening to begin with. And I'm just going to uh, talk you through a very, very powerful listening strategy that, again, I've been using for about 25, 30 years now and have deepened this practice. Um, so this is relationships both with yourself and with others are only ever about really listening. And there's a really simple fast and smart way to do that. So bear in mind that you're only ever really listening when you are completely present. In other words, your mind is silent and you are fully receptive. So to do this, you need to focus. You need to focus on your body but first and foremost, you need to focus on your breathing. So to adopt this really deep level of listening that I call mindful listening, start by focusing on and listening to your breathing. What that does is it silences your mind because it's impossible to think and focus on your breathing at the same time. Once your mind is silent and you're fully present, that enables you to listen at a much deeper level. It means that you will be able to pick up subtext and nonverbal communication that you will otherwise miss. So what you're doing is picking up 
So if you listen mindfully, you'll pick up on sensory cues. So information that essentially flows through your senses. And as I said, the subtext and nonverbal communication that you will otherwise have missed. So what this does and why it's so important in coaching is it gives you vital clues around your communication, what communication and coaching style to use, and the best way to help your message land with your team member or colleague. So allow yourself to be guided rather than worrying about what strategy you're going to use. And the way to do that is to listen mindfully. And then the next key area is all around curiosity. Now, before I came on today, I always have a moment of nerves and I've spoken to audiences of over 10,000 at Wembley and I always have that second of nerves. And what I do to stop the nerves is I tell myself that it's not about me and it really never is. It's only ever about the value that we can deliver to somebody else. Um, in, in a scenario like this. So with that in mind, it makes that approach of being and remaining curious very much easier. Because when it's not about you, judgments disappear and um, assumptions begin to fade. And we are therefore able to listen completely with curiosity. Now, if you listen like that and, and approach your mentoring and coaching relationships with curiosity, you will automatically elevate the way you coach and get better results. It will, it is, it absolutely goes without saying. So be really interested to hear what you think of that. Um, just pop your answers in the chat box. And whilst you're doing that, I've got a quick video for you. So hopefully this will play. Great. Being a coach is all about asking good open questions. And this is where the GROW model comes in. GROW is a simple but effective framework that helps your coachee understand their challenges properly and identify what their next actions should be in order to reach a solution. Let's take a look at how it works. G stands for goals. The first few questions will help your coachee to establish an appropriate objective. For example, what do you want to achieve? What does your goal mean to you? When will you meet your goal? R stands for reality. You should then ask your coachee to think practically about their goal and how it would look in reality using questions like, what support do you need to achieve your goal? What challenges do you expect to encounter? How might you deal with them? O stands for options. Next, ask your coachee to think of three or four things they could do that might help them reach their goal. Then work with your coachee to evaluate these options by asking questions like, what are the pros and cons of each option? Or what factors will you use to weigh up these options? W stands for will or way forward. Finally, establish how committed your coachee is to the actions they have agreed. To do this, ask the coachee to rate their commitment on a scale of 1 to 10. Explore together what would need to change or happen to get them to a 9 or even a 10. Identify some practical actions, such as blocking out an hour a week to work exclusively towards reaching their goal. Encourage your coachee to imagine how they will feel if they meet their objectives. Visualising a successful outcome will motivate your coachee even more. So there you have it. By using the GROW model, you can help your coachee stay on track, engage in some genuine self-reflection, and identify relevant and realistic actions that will help them achieve their overall objectives. I am really excited by some of the comments that I'm seeing in the chat box right now. Paula, 
So you are absolutely right. Paula says this is a paradigm because it's not about you, but it is about you and your mindfulness and vulnerability. You're absolutely spot on. So for me, it's not about me when I start presenting. Um, what that does is it it tells my mind, if you like, um, it takes the focus of me. So it enables me to present focusing on you and the value that I'm going to deliver without focusing on my nerves. So I find that helpful. But absolutely, 100 percent, it is all about me taking responsibility for my mindfulness, for my vulnerability, um, for my behaviours, um, how kind I am, how much I listen, how inclusive I am. Absolutely agree with you on that. Um, so, yeah, you're right. And Matthew Harrison, um, can we find out where you work, please? Because Matthew has said we call it be here now and stay curious. And I absolutely love that. So IMECI as an organisation, we are revisiting um, our values and um, we've also done some really, really deep work and are currently doing some really deep work around diversity and inclusion. And so it is so great to see things like be here now and stay curious, underpinning culture in the workplace. So... Lear model, absolutely, Yakubu. Thank you so much for that. That's another wonderful model. So that's listen, acknowledge, explore, and respond. And I use grow not because I want you to be so tied into it that you forget that coaching is an organic process, but more just to offer you a track to run on. So Andrew says we use five cat up questions, also very effective. Matthew Rolls Royce. Thumbs up to you guys, Paula, Cap Gemini, absolutely brilliant. <laughs> so great stuff. All right. So I hope you found that useful. That was Grow. And the key thing, when you, whether you're using Grow or, or any other model to support your coaching practice, is to make sure that you have set those goals. And that, and that your coachee or mentee is comfortable with them. So that whole area around commitment and then building in the accountability is absolutely key. Please don't take that as a tick box exercise. I'll tell you why. If you do not do that last step, um, and also what I mentioned earlier about the contracting, so the contracting and then building in that last step around commitment and accountability, your coachee is going to feel empty at the end of the session. So you may have developed, uh, you may have um, delivered the most fantastic coaching session where you've built trust, you've listened mindfully, there's been vulnerability, the coachee and you have felt secure in the relationship and it's grown and developed. But if you have not done that last step, in other words, built in that accountability and the commitment and ensure that your coachee reaches their goal, the rest will feel empty. So um, one of the things that I have had done to me, so I've been coached and mentored as well, and it was just the most, it felt a bit out there, if I'm honest, when somebody did it for me. And then interestingly, it's been over a year now since this person coached me and I, I had about 10 coaching sessions at the time because we were interviewing for coaches or more and this person's coaching session has really stayed with me what she did is she got me to visualize a successful outcome so she, the reason I said it was a bit out there is she had me stand up from my laptop walk around the room anchor my goal into my body um so and i did it into my stomach with an image and a year later i can still see that image where i anchored it in and i connect it to the goal which i've now achieved so visualization is very very powerful and by the way there's some incredible um studies done by an australian psychologist on visualization so if you google that um yeah really really powerful all right, so let's just move on for the sake of time to the last part. So 
I know what some of these answers are going to be because I've seen the kind of people that we've got uh, attending today's webinar. But it would be lovely to have some data on that. So you can choose more than one answer. Rob, if you wouldn't mind, I can see you've just put that up. Thank you. OK, so just pop your answers in the poll there. And I think it's useful for you as well to see where your peers are at in, in you know, some of these really leading organisations that we do business with now on a regular basis. Um, and just to take the temperature of where coaching and mentoring is now in the workplace. OK, so let's just wait for those to come through. Let's give it just another couple of seconds, um, Rob, and we'll take the answers for that. Okay, just let me know when you want me to finish. Yeah, now would be great, actually, Rob. Thank you. So Rob's just going to pop those up on the screen for us. So I said to you near the beginning when we were talking about benefits, I was going to pick up on the benefits to the organisation a little bit later on. So these are the poll results. This is really, really interesting. Um, so the percentage, um, let's just have a look here. Percentage who have internal, who have informal coaching and mentoring discussions with their teams, over 30%. That's that's absolutely brilliant. It would be great to think that um, for all of us who are on the call today, who are such advocates of coaching and mentoring, if we could spread the word, word even further in our organisations and immerse it within the culture so that more teams are taking this approach and reaping the benefits. So with that, um, thanks a lot, Rob. I think we can take that down now. Let's move on to the last part of today, which is all about culture. So here's some more um, detail in terms of benefits. This comes from the Institute of Coaching. And I really loved some of these um, because they are what we have experienced both internally and in my day to day conversations um, with people actually from some of the organisations that are on today. So one of the key things is that coaching and mentoring empower individuals and encourage them to take responsibility. So I have set up coaching and mentoring programs in organisations. And some of the sub benefits, if you like, is that whilst ensuring that confidentiality is kept in place, what it can do is um, it can act as a motivator. So if you've got some rising stars within your team and you get them to start mentoring or coaching, not only um, is that a really lovely thing to do for them, but what it also does is it helps them to deconstruct what they often do on automatic pilot, therefore enabling them to improve and develop their skill sets in a way that they would not normally have been able to do because you can't spot those gaps unless you're teaching somebody else. And then the other sub benefit that I've noticed, again, as I say, when setting up um, mentoring and coaching programs internally is that you can get together a board of coaches and mentors who are sort of key players, if you like, within the organisation. And what we used to do is get them to meet up on a quarterly basis and actually just debrief, um, you know, some of the, the CEOs and the board um, on some of the things that they've been observing. So some of the things you can debrief on are things like we're, we're trying to get more inclusive, but the feedback from um, you know coaches is that they don't feel that we are living up to these values or we've put through some new values um, into the organization but they're not landing with people people don't understand what they are and how it applies to them so these are things that I've heard being fed back to um, more senior management as a result of having these coaching and mentoring boards so they can be really powerful and again, as I say, obviously, without disclosing anything personal. 
So finally, here are seven steps to support you in developing a coaching and mentoring culture where you are already. And if you are already doing some of these things, think about stop, start, continue, change and apply that to this and think, what are we doing well at the moment? What are we not doing so well? What could we do with changing? What can we keep? And evaluating the answers to all these questions, what one action am I as an individual or should we as an organisation look to implement going forwards? So the stop, start, continue, change, very, very powerful for self-reflection and for reflective, adopting a reflective practice on a wider scale as well. So finally, I just want to make you aware because a lot of the people that I speak to are not aware that we do this. We do it almost at cost. So it's extremely cost effective. But we have a, a team diagnostic that we've proven out on over 10,000 people across one and a half thousand teams with some of the UK's largest engineering companies. And what this will do is it will across nine, sorry, 11 key indicators is it will help to feed into your group coaching conversations. It will enable you to see how, how your team sees you and um, to give you some really tangible data to help you develop and move your coaching forwards. So please don't forget that we have this and you can contact us at training at imackie.org if you'd like to find out a little bit more about them or you can see how they work on our website. So in the chat box, before we start taking questions, one thing that struck you today, put that in the chat box. One thing that you thought, that's interesting, I'm going to investigate that, whether it was no rules, rules and feedback, whether it's stop, start, continue, change, whether it's what can I personally um, do to create a culture of mentoring and coaching within my organisation. So perhaps it was one of the seven areas that I put on the screen a minute ago. So in the chat box, one key thing that struck you today. Across each of these four areas. Stop, start, continue, change. Thanks so much, Matt. Helen says the GROW model. Yeah, Michael, honestly, read the book. Um, I've started reading it and it's brilliant. Those team dinner feedback sessions. That was No Rules Rules by Erin Meyer. Netflix work culture, yeah. Yeah, definitely worth. I don't recommend many books, by the way, but okay. Brilliant. Yolanda says styles of coaching. Andrew says the styles of coaching. The breathing technique to help with listening. And honestly, Andrew, it really works. It's so simple. But having your mind completely silent like that, it's like it flicks a switch and it puts you into a very, very different state. Um, so I am going to start taking questions in a second. I want to leave you with this. And it's something that we often forget. And, and I know that I do. You know, I, I listen to I occasionally get on a webinar and I think that was amazing. And I'm, I want to do this and I want to do that or. You know, as always, I'm I'm always on enrolled on courses. I I am a lifelong learner, um, and I forget that actually learning is all about incremental application of what I have just absorbed. So one small thing can make a really big difference. And, and that is the power of stop, start, continue, change. If you do that regularly and take one action from it, put that action into practice and you will start to be amazed, actually, at the cumulative impact of these small, consistent actions. So what I'd like you to do is we've talked a lot about how coaching is powerful and it seems like a lot of you are coaches. 
So I'm actually just going to turn the spotlight on you and get you to make yourself accountable. What one action will you take as a result of today? Pop your answers in the chat box. What one action will you take as a result of today? As I said to you at the beginning, I do not take your time commitment of an hour lightly. I really, really want you to have tangible, to squeeze some tangible value out of today. And we've got five minutes to take questions. So, Rob, has anything come up in the chat box? Great, Peter. Absolutely. Um, yeah, there are a couple of things, Alison. Firstly, right. uh, um, let me add something in the chat box now. In the chat box, I've just pasted um, in there some uh, future courses that we can do. Uh, information linking to the website so mentoring for mpds mentoring skills the cmi level five awarding coaching and mentoring you, you mentioned earlier yeah and, and also information on how to access these slides uh, in the next couple of days from the from the lms and all the past uh webinars that we've done um so i can see you, you've, you've put those uh, some information up on the slides as well Correct. um the first question i have here is how to approach a non response a non-responsive coachee OK, so I, I would actually I think if you've tried some of the standard um, approaches, if it was me, I'd want to understand why. What is it um, about what are they resisting? And so sometimes in life um, and, and, and life in a way, you know, real conversations in a way are coaching conversations. Um, I want to find out why. What is it about that person that they are putting up a barrier to their development? And the first thing that I'm going to ask them is, is it something that I've done, you know, or, or something within the group? Have, have we in any way made you uncomfortable? Um, have you felt, do you feel that there's something that is preventing you from pro progressing or really investing in your development? So I'll give a few examples like that. And then I'm silent. And I wait. And the reason I do that is not to make it awkward, but to give them a chance to absorb what I've just said and think about what answer they're going to come back to me with. And if they say I'm not sure, I'll say that's absolutely fine. Why don't we just agree to reconvene in a couple of days when you've had a chance to think it over? And then we can take a look at, you know, why this perhaps might even not be the right approach for you and what else we could do to help you develop so if you like what i'm doing in answer to that question is throwing a few different things out there and generally one of those hooks that person um and they will come back to me i have had people come back to me saying actually you know what it was none of those things i've been feeling really uncomfortable recently because you know, hybrid working means that I'm, I haven't got the same team interaction that I've had before or problems at home is making me feel super vulnerable. But whatever it is, normally that will open the door to a deeper conversation. Thank you, Alison. Uh, next question I've got here is how could we raise the topic of having a contract to define the coaching relationship in a comfortable way? I just talk to people about the benefits to them and to me. Um, what I say to them is that, you know, from your point of view, it gives you a track to run on. And it helps to give us a better understanding of expectations, what I expect from you and what you have a right to expect from me. What it also does is protect you in terms of confidentiality. And I also say to my coaches and ment mentees, just to be clear, if there is, if I do at any point feel like you might be a danger to yourself, then I will ask your permission to open up the conversation to somebody else. So um, we do mental health first aid and I am a mental health first aider. And I have found that it has helped 
Um, it's not a prerequisite for coaching, but it does give you an extra dimension to your coaching practice. Um, but I, I will tell people that that is the only time that I will talk to them about the fact that I might have to breach confidentiality by sharing information. Um, so, yeah, talk to them about the benefits. Pleasure, Peter. <laughs> That's so lovely to hear. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Alison, next question. Uh, advice on mentoring someone who struggles to set their own goals? Yeah, just do it in very small increments. As it's half past, um, I don't want to take up too much of your time. But yeah, do it in small increments. So very, very small bite sized goals. Um, so that you're drip feeding them, essentially. Listen, guys, thank you so much for today. I don't want to run over on time. Rob, thank you so much. And Kirsty in the background, as always, for your amazing support. Um, and to all of you who've made today so enjoyable. And I look forward to catching up with you on future webinars. Take care, everyone. Thank you, Alison.